Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad to have you with us. If you're here live in the room or online, my name is Hannah. I'm part of our staff team with Worship Arts. So we're glad to have you with us today so we can worship our God, connect to one another in community. I want to invite you to stand if you are uh, able. And we're going to worship our God together. Singing this first song, You Deserve It, God. All the glory, all of our praise.
Father, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time together in worship as a community. God, I pray that these wouldn't just be songs that we sing, but that these would be words that we believe and prayers that we mean. God, I pray that as Pastor Charles comes up to preach, God, that these wouldn't just be his words, but God, that we would open our hearts to hear the message that you have for us in this time. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you've given, all that you will do, the ways that you've provided for us and the ways that we know we can be lean on you and that you'll be faithful. In your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, how's everyone doing this morning? Awesome. Hey, what, here in this room, why don't you go ahead and grab a seat? Thanks so much for joining us. It's so good to be here, gathered together in this room, worshiping together. Um, and welcome to everyone joining us online and worshiping with us as well. We love you guys and so glad that you're here with us as well. Uh, if you are new to Blackhawk Church, we would love to connect with you. So after service, step on out to that next steps area. We have a small gift for you that we would love to give you. Um, so come say hello. We would love to say hello back and tell you a little bit about Black Hawk Church. Or if you're just looking for ways to connect or to take your next step, whether that's learning or connecting to a group or serving or even just discovering more of what it looks like to follow Jesus, head on out there as well and we would love to talk to you. Uh, for those of us here in this room, but also people watching online right now, maybe you're like watching as you head back from a weekend away or a vacation or something like that. You couldn't be here this morning. A reminder that we have an evening service here at Blackhawk at Brader Way, 4.30. It's this really cool, smaller community. It's a great opportunity to get to know a smaller group of people. So join us for that if you're getting back into town on a given weekend, or if you just prefer something a little bit smaller, we would love to connect with you at the 4.30 service. Uh, something coming up next weekend, next Sunday, March 3rd, is the African Social Gathering. This is going to be a potluck. So if you are in the African community and want to meet other Africans here at Black Hawk Church, we would love for you to come for this time of fellowship, bring something to pass, bring friends or family members. Um, this is a really sweet time of fellowship. I've been able to drop in on a couple of these, and there's people from all different countries, all around Africa, multiple languages being spoken, and it's just a really great opportunity to meet some other people. So join us for that. All right, and then lastly, Pastor Charles is gonna come up in just a second, but I wanna encourage us this morning to like lean in and be expectant of what it is that God might do in our midst. That's true every single Sunday. Like every time we gather, God wants to work in us as individuals and in our community to change and to transform us. But especially the passage that we're gonna be looking at today, like if we get this, has the power to change and to transform everything about our lives. So let's lean in and just come with openness of what it is that God might want to do today. Amen? All right, uh, let me hand it off to Pastor Charles. Well, now, before I uh, get into uh, my talk on uh, James, I wanna just spend a few minutes talking to those of you who consider Blockhawk your home church. This is your spiritual home. Um, for the past two weeks, Pastor Matt has been up here talking about Project Tech. And today, I just wanna kind of bring it all together, right? So what is Project Tech? Well, Project Tech is this initiative where we are actually gonna refurnish, uh, refurbish and, and renew the technology at Blockhawk Church. And the question you're all asking is, why now? The answer is technology was from 2007. 17 years old. We have 2007 technology. We have technology built from 20, 2010, 2013. We have layers and layers and stuff built on top of each other, and they're all talking to each other in strange and odd ways. The whole thing is duct taped together. It's called a Frankenstein system. Now, look, this just happened Thursday, just three days ago. We were running the uh, politics and faith class. 250 people signed up. Some of you probably were part of that class. We were scheduled to do our, our class on the west side. The sound didn't work. Came over here. Sound didn't work. 30 minutes later, we jerry-rigged a speaker and a couple mics. We got the class done. Okay? Now, our brilliant, our wonderful tech director, Barry Shimp, he went ahead and did debugging, trying to figure out what the problem was. It took him 10 hours. Too complicated. Too many texts layered on top of each other. Our technology is becoming increasingly unreliable, and when something breaks down, hard to figure out what's wrong. That's 
We can't have that here, folks. We can't have that. Look, for, for Black Hawk, for what we're called to do, technology is mission critical. So you know this, okay? You know this. We have to fix this. We have to update. That's just a reality. We got to do it. But you also know, right, that when we update, it is wise to take a look at the future. So let's say you had an iPhone 4. You know, you had it for five years or so. It, it broke. Do you buy another iPhone 4? No, you wouldn't think of doing that. No, you buy a new phone because you need a model because that's going to help you take you into, into the next five years, next, next five years. We need technology that's going to take us into the next five years to face the new challenges that we did not see back in 2007. Some of these new challenges, we want new capabilities, okay? Three areas. Number one, online presence. We didn't do online back in 2007. Now we're doing it. And we're doing it with, a, with, a, with a kind of a patched together technology. We need better technology. Why? Because people are counting on it. We have block hawkers who have been here for years because of health reasons, because, because of work reasons. They can't come in person. They're counting on our ability to not just stream Sunday, but also stream from the west side for the baptism services, to be able to stream from Fitchburg. We want those capabilities so that we can, people who can't make it here can be part of our church. We have people who don't come to church because they've been hurt by churches or they're having doubts about their faith. We're hearing story. We hear from them. They watch our online services. They're connecting to God and connecting to us while not being physically present. And then I can't tell you how many times this has happened. I meet somebody. They say, hey, Pastor Charles. And I say, hey, have we met before? They say, this is my first time at Blockout Church. Well, how do you know me? We've been watching you since before we got to Madison. Do you understand? When people move to Madison, they do church shopping online. They find us before that, okay? We need an online presence. That's number one. Number two, we want better security and safety for our kids. So we want to get cameras, security cameras, for this location, for all three locations. Those of you who are, who are parents, you understand this. We love our kids. We want them to be safe. So that's a no-brainer. We got to do that. And then and number three, and this, I'm so, super excited about this. New technology is coming down the pike that's, uh, that will allow us to reach people in different language groups and helping those who, are, who have hearing impaired, who are hearing impaired. And we need technology that's going to be flexible enough to be able to incorporate this new technology, all the new tools that are coming down the pike. So those three things we want, we want to gain. Those three capacities that are mission critical for us. It's going to cost money. $3.5 million. Now, the good news, we have over a million dollars of intentions that's already come in. Okay, so that's already come in. And what we need is for all of us who, are, who, are, who, are, who call Blockout Church, our home church, we need you in the game. We need you to jump in. We need you to come in and fill in the rest. So I challenge you. I ask you. Go to Blockout Church, Blockout.Church Project Tech. Go there and make an intention before March 10th. Why March 10th? Because at some point, we need to know how much money we have so we can make decisions. So March 10th is absolutely critical. You don't have to send the money before March 10th. You can do it monthly. Serena and I, we, we made an intention, and then we've been giving monthly ever since. And you can give all the way out to June of 2025. So will you do this with us? We need everybody. Okay, if we do this together... It won't be hard, but we need everybody. Will you make an intention on Project Tech? Let me pray for us. Father, Father, I just, I just want to say, I, 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 I know, I know it's, it's not easy because giving to technology doesn't move our hearts the way that giving to other things do. We know that. So, Father, we pray that you move in the hearts of your people because you, the, the place you have called us to be, you have called Blackout to be, technology is mission critical. We need technology to do the things you have called us to do. So we want that fixed. Put us on a place where we can build a community to reach a community. Father, we pray that you're moving today in the hearts of your people. You're releasing resources so we can get this done for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We took a, a family trip uh, last month uh, to Taiwan. I, I was born in Taiwan. Uh, I haven't been back since 1988. It's a long time. Um, my, my wife and, and, and Serena and the kids have, actually have never been to Taiwan. So this is their first time. Beautiful place. Love, love the food, love the people, wondrous beauty of the island. But you know, while I was there, I could never fully relax. Just couldn't do it. My brain was constantly spinning. It was doing two things. Number one, it was calculating the time difference. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I'm, I'm like writing texts, writing emails to people in Madison. And, and, and so, so it's like, wait a minute, uh, uh, I had to figure out what time is in Madison, right? And now Taiwan is 14 hours ahead of us. So you take our time, add two, flip the AM and the PM. In Taiwan, you had to do that in reverse, which is actually harder especially if you're kind of jet-lagged. Um, I found out just like a couple of weeks ago that Pastor Matt was receiving texts at 3 o'clock in the morning. I was waking him up. <laughs> Clearly, I was not very good at this. Okay. The other thing that was occupying my mind, trying to figure out how much everything costs. First night we were there, kind of a big family gathering for, for dinner, and, and I, I saw the I check. I took a glance at it. I'm going, oh my gosh, $1,500. Ah! Okay, right, complete freak out, right? You know, still jet-lagged, right? Okay. Took me a moment going, oh, that's right. Not U.S. dollars, new Taiwan dollars. Okay, what does that mean? Pull on my, my phone, put on my trusty currency conversion app, right? Choose new Taiwan dollars, type in 1500 and hit convert and bam. Oh, 47.67 U.S. dollars. Not bad. Like sit down dinner for eight, really good food. That's pretty good. Right? So good food, good prices in Taiwan. Just give you a quick plug. Okay. <laughs> but I was doing that constantly everywhere we went because there's a lot of good shopping, like night market. Absolutely fantastic, right? You can, you can just go and, and check out all kinds of stuff going on in Taiwan. And my mind was constantly converting new Taiwan dollars to U.S. dollars. You're running that app. New Taiwan dollars, U.S. US dollars, right? And not just currency. Everything I was seeing, there was kind of this mental calculation that was going on. That's converting them into the lens of kind of American values, American culture. Now, why am I talking about this? It's because this conversion experience that we do when we travel to another country, that's what we're called to do as Christ followers on a constant basis. You see, the Bible is very clear. It says, all of us who are Christ followers, we're citizens of the kingdom of God. We live here in America as exiles. This country, for us, is a foreign country, which means whatever we experience and see here, we should be converting that so that we can understand them in the kingdom of God. Okay? Let's imagine there's an app for that. I'm going to call it the Kingdom Values Conversion App. <laughs> can, can, can I just be clear? Not a real app. Please don't send me emails. I can't find it in the App Store. Don't do that. Okay, no, not a real app. This is, this is something that you're supposed to run in your brain, okay? It's supposed to be doing that conversion all the time. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the KVC app. But before I keep going, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Charles. I'm one of the pastors on the teaching team. Um, we are in this absolutely am amazing book called the book of James. And um, last week, if you missed it, you got to catch it online. Pastor Matt did something amazing. He came up here and he recited the entire book of James, all five chapters. Okay? That's amazing for him to do. But you know what's more amazing? For us to experience that, to hear the entire, the fullness of the letter and feel its power. Okay? Today, we're going to dive into um, the beginning part of that book. And I'm just going to give you a bit of warning. Uh, the book of James... <laughs> tells the truth and it hits hard. It's not a comfortable read, right? I hope you're prepared. Hope you're prepared. If you have your Bible, please turn to James chapter one or your smart device, go to James chapter one. We're looking at verses one through 11. Verse one reads like this, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. As we learned last week, James is not one of the 12 disciples. He is Jesus's younger brother. And, and Peter started the church in Jerusalem. After Peter left, James took over. He became one of the major leaders of the early church until he was murdered for his faith in the 60s of the first century. In this letter, he's writing to the 12 tribes scattered. The word in Greek is diaspora or in exile. 
the 12 trials in exile among the nations. He's writing to Jewish Christians who are scattered around the Mediterranean Sea. Now, we often say at Blackhawk, the Bible's not written to us, but for us. But in this issue of being in exile, we're in the same boat as the Jewish Christians. Right? The Bible is clear. We are citizens of God's kingdom. We're in exile in this country. This is not our country. This is a foreign land. Now, what does that mean, to be in exile? It turns out that's a big, big topic. Uh, we could do a whole sermon series on what it means to live in exile in America. But today I want to focus on one topic, right? I want to focus on that conversion that we need to do as people from the kingdom living here. Right? We live here, we look at things, we experience things, and we see them through American cultural values. But as Christ followers, we're called to take an extra step. We're called to take that experience and convert them so that we see them through the values of the kingdom of God, the KVC app. Right? We're called to use and run the kingdom values conversion app. And that's where James goes in verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Okay, just heads up right from the beginning, all right? Um, some of you, you're going through trials and sufferings right now, and, and this is not a fun verse to read. I just want to say that, right? But James isn't trying to be the pastor who's coming alongside you and trying to encourage you. No, he's trying to be the pastor who's gonna kick you in the pants and get you going. And for some of us right now, that's not what you need. So just want you to hear that, okay? That's not what you need. But for many of us who are not going through trials and sufferings right now, we still have all kinds of questions. We're like, James, what are you talking about? How can we experience trials and suffering and respond with pure joy? That doesn't make sense. I mean, like, like okay, I, let's say I get fired. My right? pastor Matt says, Charles, you're done, you're out of here. Am I supposed to go, oh, that's so awesome. I feel so much joy. Is that the response you want from me, James? Or, or, or if my, a doctor calls me, hey, Charles, I, I got bad news for you. Am I supposed to go, oh, that's so great. I feel joy. Is that the right response? It feels kind of weird, right? It's a little creepy. <laughs> so, James, what are you talking about? Well, let's start out with clarification. James is not asking us to respond to trials and sufferings with feelings of joy. That is absolutely not what he's looking for. Right? Rather, he wants us to respond in a different way. The key word is consider. The Greek word is hegeomai, which means to engage in an intellectual process. In this verse, it means to, to engage in an intellectual process when you convert one thing to something else. In other words, what James is saying is, turn on your Kingdom Values Conversion app that runs in your head, okay? Let me make it clear, crystal clear. James is not asking us to feel joy. He's asking us to make the conversion. Like you, put, you, get, your map, you get your app running, you type in your trials and your sufferings, right? And what happens is the output is pure joy. Obvious next question. What kind of an app is this? <laughs> right? I mean, how do you go from here to here? How does that even work? What's the underlying formula? What is the source code? That's the question, right? Well, James gives it to you. James explained the source code. <laughs> but, but before I go there, uh, let me explain something else, okay? Uh, the, the word for face is peripipto. Uh, it means to fall into. So James is not talking about trials and sufferings that you you know, that you kind of chose for yourself. Let's say you got all kinds of muscle ache because you're doing CrossFit. Okay, that's your problem. Okay. <laughs> that's your problem. You chose that, okay? I have a no pain, no pain philosophy. <laughs> um, no, that's not what James is talking about. James is talking about circumstances that you do not choose, you do not expect. So illnesses, financial catastrophe, um, becoming a victim of injustice or violence, loss of loved ones, circumstances that you do not choose, you do not anticipate. And, and, and James says, okay, now, what does the KVC app does? What does the AKVC app do when you type that in? Well, what you get is 
a testing of your faith. Step one of the formula, the KVC app takes trials and suffering and sees it as a testing of your faith. Now, the moment we see the word testing, we're all going, Ugh. right? Test is a stressful word. Most of us have gone to school, some more than others, and testing is always something that makes you go, uh, if I do poorly, I feel bad about myself, right? right? And, and if you're good at taking tests, you, you might come from families or, or ethnic backgrounds that's a little bit more perfectionistic. Have you guys heard the joke, like, what's an Asian F? A minus? <laughs> Okay, so test is stressful. (laughs) Testing is stressful, especially like, okay, if God is testing my faith, what if I fail? What does that mean? So another bit of clarification. The word for testing here is dokimion, and it is not a test you take in school. It's not a pass-fail test. It's a test that's more appropriate for material science or metallurgy. So let's say you find a piece of metal or from, you know, like like a piece of something from under the ground. It's, it's, It's an alloy. And you want to figure out its composition. You, you want to figure out what's in it. You run a test. You run a dokimion. A dokimion will reveal its composition. You see, what James says is trials and suffering has a way of revealing things about you, especially the parts of you that has been shaped by your faith. All of us who are Christ followers, we trust God to some degree in some ways in different parts of our lives. The thing is, when we're going through life, normal life, it's all pretty good, pretty okay, we don't really see what's going on. We don't really see faith operating in our lives. But trials and sufferings has a way of bringing our normal life to a halt. And invariably, it forces us to look at ourselves and ask questions. And we see going, oh, wow, I have faith in this area, but not in this area. I have a lot of faith here, not very much faith here. We start seeing our faith. Testing and trials, you know, trials and suffering is a test that reveals the state of our faith. 20 years ago, um, I was a graduate student in the Department of Hebrew and Semitics here at UW. And um, I was doing my PhD prelims. And one Saturday morning, I felt this pain in my eye. I felt like somebody was scratching it. It hurt. Oh, it hurt. It hurt so bad that we found an ophthalmologist that very day and, you know, he, he brought me in, he, he looked at it, and he said, well, Charles, you have corneal epithelial erosion, which in English means that a huge chunk of the skin that's, that's protecting the surface of my eyeball has fallen off. But he says, it's okay, it'll grow back in about three or four days. He was wrong. What we didn't know at the time was that I didn't have corneal epithelial erosion, I had recurrent corneal epithelial erosion, which meant huge chunks of the skin that's protecting my eyeball was falling off on a daily or every couple days. (sighs) I remember those days. (laughs) It's hard to forget. Um, I would wake up each morning before before I open my eyes, I'd be wide awake and I'm lying there and I'm wondering a simple question. Is today going to be a good day or a bad day? A good day, moderate amount of pain. I can't see, read much. I can't do any work. But I can get up, I can like, you know, take the girls to school, I can go shopping, make dinner. When Serena gets home from teaching, I can talk to her about her work. That's a good day. Bad days are when the pain got so intense that I'm doped up on coding. My mind's a blur. I spend all day lying in my room in the dark because light makes the pain 10 times worse. It's not just a constant pain. It's that in moments of clarity, I get to survey the wreckage that was my life. I was a grad student, on my way to a PhD in the Old Testament, wife, two girls. My plan was to graduate, become a professor at a seminary or or, a research university. Now I can't read, can't write, can't work, can barely get out of the house. My mind's hazy regularly from opioids. (laughs) The doctors, After trying a few things, they kind of gave up. They said, eh, maybe it'll go away on its own. Four-year period. Four years. Questions haunted me. What if it doesn't get better? What if I spend the rest of my life in pain and in darkness? I learned a lot in those four years. Um, two biggest things I learned. One, my wife is amazing. 
she, uh, she worked full time teaching. She came home when I, when I couldn't do anything. She took care of the kids. She took care of me. I never heard a word of complaint or anger or frustration, not a word. The second thing I learned, I'm a child of God, beloved by the creator God of the universe. Nothing else matters. My value is not founded on what I can do or what people think of me, not my work, not my speaking ability, not what I know, none of that. No, no, no. I am founded in Christ and Christ alone. Suffering and trials reveals the state of our faith. It tells us what's going on. It strips away the irrelevancies of life. It gets rid of things that don't matter so you can see the things that truly matter. And when you see your faith helping you through hard times, when you see it, that faith grows. That faith strengthens. And eventually that faith creates perseverance. And that's step two of the KVC formula. Faith produces perseverance. The Greek word is hypomone, which I think the etymology of this word produces a wonderful kind of a, a, a word picture. Uh, the first part is hypo. You can see it here is, is you know, hypo. It means to under, right? You know, as in hypoglycemia. I'm diabetic. I know the word. Uh, Monet means to remain. So perseverance, you see a word picture of remaining under. The ability to bear burden, to carry, to stand under trials and suffering. That's what testing, what's the, what the faith does to you, what trials and suffering does to you is reveals your faith and grows that faith when you see it. And now you have the ability to carry on longer and longer and further and further. And if you let that perseverance run, we get to step three. It produces for you two things, teleos and holokleros. Holokleros means to be complete, to be whole, to be intact. Teleos is a great word. Sometimes it's translated as perfect. It can mean that in Greek. It's, it's certainly not what James means here. James does not mean, mean it to be perfect here. Most likely what he means by this word is to be fully integrated, okay? single-minded. Your actions, your words, your beliefs all cohere in alignment with the values of the kingdom of God. Okay? That's what perseverance do for you. It creates in you teleos and holokleros. Intact wholeness, fully integrated. That's the KVC app formula. Let's take a look. You punch in unexpected trials and suffering, and that reveals the state of your faith. And when you see your faith in action, that produces perseverance in you, your ability to stand under things. And then that, when, it, when you let that do its work, produces holokleros and teleos, fullness and full integration. And when you have that, you don't need anything else. You have reached the transformation that God's looking for. How do we get to pure joy? Well, James skipped the step. He assumes you know this step, though. The step is this. Being transformed into the image of Christ is cause for pure joy. And we're supposed to know that. Okay? So this is the KVC app formula, the KVC app source code. Okay, Know this. Now, we see this KVC app in action just a few passages down. When we get to verse 9, um, this is, we, we see this, <laughs> how, how this app it applies to a, to a different situation. So we're going to skip verses 5 through 8 for now, but we will come back. Okay. Uh, verse 9, believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed in the same way the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. James now starts talking to Christ followers who, are, who have experienced or are experiencing poverty. Now being poor is challenging in and of itself, but in most human societies, we have social hierarchy based on wealth, right? The rich is up here, the poor is down here, right? That's why James is talking about high and low positions. And so what James says is this, okay? Those of you who are poor, okay? How does kingdom of God view poverty and wealth, right? In, in, in our world, we have social hierarchy based on how much money you have. 
Is that the case in the kingdom of God? What is the values of the kingdom of God when it comes to wealth and poverty? Well, let's see it. Let's run poverty through the KVC app. Well, poverty is a kind of trials and suffering, is it not? Every day, I don't have much money. I'm trusting on God every day. I'm leaning on God for a way to survive. Oh, wow, this is happening on a daily basis. This is, this is revealing the state of my faith, and I'm growing in my faith and growing in perseverance, and I'm becoming whole and fully integrated. Woohoo! cause for pure joy. But it's more than that, because wholeness and integrity is valued in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, we value people who have been transformed. So what happens? High position. High position. Right? James says to, to the brothers and sisters, to the believers in humble circumstances, they ought to take pride in their high position. The verb there is kakaomai, which means to rely on, to have confidence in. So he says to those who, are, who, are, who, are, who face poverty, he says, trust have confidence that your circumstances are producing you opportunities to become transformed into the likeness of Christ. And that is the basis of your exaltation within God's people. Flip that around. What about those who are wealthy? What about Christ followers who are wealthy? And James says, well, look, your wealth gives you fewer opportunities to see your faith in action. Now, let, let me be clear, okay? Let me just be clear. Okay? James is not talking about, okay, look, for those who are wealthy, you, it, this, James is not saying you don't have other opportunities to become transformed. You, can, you, you will encounter other trials and sufferings. James is not getting at that, okay? What he's getting at is something simply this, which is when you compare wealth against poverty, wealth produces fewer opportunities for transformation. Therefore, low position. Let me, I want to clarify something here. I want to make sure I, we, we, don't, we don't miss this point. James is not talking about self-esteem. He's not saying, oh, poor people, you should feel better about yourself. He's going much further than that. Okay. He's saying that if you run KVC, you will have a drastic reversal within the social hierarchy of the kingdom of God. And if a church, if a church wants to express the values of God's kingdom, we will see things differently. We will have the posture when we see somebody who have experienced poverty, our initial assumption, now they may not have taken advantage of their opportunities to be transformed, but our assumption is, oh, we need to honor them because they have had a lot of chances to become spiritually mature. And we need to have that posture. Serena and I, uh, and, and Pastor Koya and, and his wife Myra and their son Isaac, we took a trip a couple years ago to, to Malawi to see what God is doing in that country. Um, Malawi ranks as part of the top 10 poorest countries in the world. Uh, just a kind of comparison, the annual GDP per capita for Malawi is $645. That's less than $2 per person per day. The point of reference, U.S. GDP per capita is $76,000. We traveled around Malawi. We, saw, we met we went to different villages, met pastors, Christ followers, churches, and our team afterwards, we did a debrief. <laughs> and it's, it's con complete consensus. We all saw exactly the same thing. We have so much to learn about their joy, about their faith, and about the close-knit community that should mark the kingdom of God. Not just our trip. I mean, look, we have people in our, in our, in our church who have gone to short-term mission to, to places of deep poverty, and they met Christ followers, and if you talk to them, they will say pretty much the same thing. The Christ followers in those countries that we met have deeper joy, deeper faith, and closer-knit community than what we experience on average as American Christians. So this should be our posture. As American Christians who, come, who live in a culture of material prosperity, and a material abundance. We take pride. We have confidence in our lower position. We acknowledge and we see Christ followers in other countries who are in deep poverty. We honor them and we want to learn from them. That should be our posture. 
Now, I know you have all kinds of questions right now. Some of you are like, wait, is James calling us to a life of poverty? Or, or maybe like, should we be helping Christ followers in other countries that are poor because that we're taking away their opportunities to grow? Anybody think that? We have all kinds of questions about money, really. And, and we're, gonna keep, keep, we're gonna keep talking about wealth and poverty and we're gonna keep talking about money in this series because James keeps talking about it. And, and, and here's the challenge is that James, when he talks about money, he assumes you know what the Bible says about it, which means he doesn't answer most of your questions. When you read James, you're gonna get very frustrated. And so what we decided to do is we decided to create a three-week series after the book of James to talk about, do a biblical theology of money. Like, what exactly does the Bible say? Uh, what is the right relationship between, between our relationship between us and money so that we can then handle our wealth in a way that images God? So that three-week series is coming up. So if you have all kinds, if James is causing you all kinds of questions about wealth and money, save, write those down, save them, and we'll try to get to them in that series. But today, I don't want to spend a lot of time diving into kind of the rabbit trails of wealth and poverty because I want to focus on the Kingdom Values Conversion Act. I want to focus on this process that we're supposed to develop so we can think differently, right? And the question I think many of us are asking is, how do we start thinking this way, right? How do we download the app? Okay. Reminder, not a real app, okay? <laughs> no, how do we develop this way of thinking that so we can take what we see and just kind of do that conversion? Well, James answers that question in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Now, I know there are scholars who argue that James is starting a new topic here in verse 5. I think the better reading is to read verse 5 through 8 with, with the whole passage. Because verses 2 through 4, we just talked about, James is talking about Hegelomai. He's saying, hey, engage in that intellectual process to convert suffering to pure joy. Right? And then verse 9 through 11, engage that intellectual process so you end up seeing poverty as high position and wealth as low position. So in between that, I think it's a better reading to understand the wisdom that J James is talking about as being the KVC app. If any of you don't have the KVC app, you should ask God. I think that makes most sense. Now, how do you get it? Actually, really simple. If you want to think like this, if you want the app, just ask God and he'll give it to you. Gee, that's simple. Actually, it's not. You see, the problem here is that I think we actually skipped a question. I think we skipped a question, right, right? James says, if you want the app, it's yours. The prior question is, do you actually want the app? And that's the question that underlies verses six through eight. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. In this passage, where doubting is not about questioning whether, whether God can give you wisdom. No, 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 no. The, the question, the doubt you have right now is whether you actually want the app, whether you actually want to think this way, whether you want this wisdom from God. Look, look at verse 8. The way it describes this person is the person is double-minded. The Greek there is um, dipsukos, which if you look at the transliteration, is actually dipsychos, right? Two psyches, two minds. One mind says, oh, wow, kingdom value conversion. Now, that sounds fun. I want that. That looks really cool. That's exciting. Another part says, oh, I don't think I want that at all. And when you're, you can't decide, James says, God is not going to force it on you. You have to want it. So that's my question for you today. Do you want the KVC app? Do you want a mental process running in your head that takes what you see, what you experience, what you feel, convert them so that you understand them, so you evaluate them based on the values of the kingdom of God. This is not a rhetorical question. The, obvious is not an the answer is not an obvious yes. 
I don't want to mislead anyone, okay? I don't want to mislead people. KVC app involves a radical reprogramming of how your brain works. It doesn't change your experiences at all. It changes your perception of your experiences. It changes how you evaluate your experiences. It turns them and flips them upside down, sideways, in all kinds of ways. Are you sure you want that? When you run into something that goes wrong, I don't know, just on the way home, get pulled over by a police officer, how do you respond? Typically, anger, frustration, woe is me, blame casting, the KVC app running will get you to consider it pure joy. Not the first time you run it, not the second time you run it, but you keep running that app. At some point, you will see a trial, a suffering, and you go, oh, I think that's worthy of joy. And at some point, you will feel that joy. Is that what you want? When it comes to wealth and poverty, <laughs> the KVC app flips, flips this hierarchy upside down and enacts a drastic reversal of social hierarchy among the people of God. With the KVC app running, I look at a person who comes from a place of deep poverty, I assume, now it may not be true, they may not have any spiritual depth, but I honor them, I assume that they've had, had opportunities to grow and to be deep in Christ and I treat them that way, that's my posture. I meet a person who comes out of a place of deep wealth and material abundance. They may very well be spiritually profound and deep. They may have been transformed by other things, but I start with the posture of they need more opportunities to grow. Do you wanna think like this? Do you wanna see wealth and poverty this way? Do you want to think differently? The KVC app causes you to perceive, to evaluate, to experience the world in an entirely new way. It causes you to experience them the way Jesus does. Do you want to think like Jesus? Not just behave, not just change our behavior. To think to experience, to feel, to evaluate the way Jesus does. Is that what you want? Be honest with yourself. That's the question I wanna leave you today. Um, we are doing a scripture memory challenge, this series, and it just happens to be these three verses. We want to challenge Black Hawk Church as a whole. Everybody, we need you. We want you to memorize verses two, three, and four of James chapter one. We want you to put the source code of the KVC app in your head. Whether you run it or not, that's up to you. But we want you to memorize this so you can access it whenever you need to. Okay? So let's, let's read it together. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let me pray for us. Father, I wanna thank you for, the, for, for our brother James and in the way that I'm, responding to, to stress and, to, and, 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 and testing and trials because this book is hard. Every time I read it, it feels like it's a, it's a gut punch. I don't think like this. I don't see trials and suffering as joy. I rarely think about them as ways of being cha you, of you changing me. I'm just not seeing the world this way. I definitely don't see wealth and poverty the way you see. So I confess that before you, I laid that out before you. And Father, I, I pray for us as a church that we would desire, that we get to a place where we want to see the world the way you do. Me personally, for our whole church, that we want this app running. We can see the world differently. And 
all God's people said. Amen.
Teach me to love you, oh my God, all my heart, my soul. For whom have I in heaven or earth? None but you alone. Help me to love. But even more, help me to love anyone who intends to do me on. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever and ever. And yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory forever. to live out of weakness. Yours is the kingdom of these. Help me to thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who seek. Free me from want. Free me from want and from worry. As you care for the smallest of James, how are we doing so far? Right? This is, it's good, but this is hard. This is challenging stuff, but already two weeks in, God, just in my own life, I can see how God is using this to, to change and to challenge me and to transform me. And I'm hearing stories of the ways that, whether through these messages or even uh, the Bible study in James that many of you are in, that, that God is doing the same thing. So praise God for the work that he's doing in the room this morning and as we leave here today. Uh, just a reminder that every single week, and this week included, that there's a team of prayer volunteers up here 
that would love to be able to pray for you or with you. And it's the same team um, from week to week often, so you'll see a lot of the, the same kind of faces and that kind of thing. So we would love to pray for you, especially after a message like that and the things that you might be going through or, or thinking about. This comes later in James, but James says that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So let's continue to just be praying for each other and come up afterward if that would be something that's helpful. All right, so we also have this memory verse that we're doing. We just read it a minute ago, but let's let that be our benediction today. That'll pop up on the screen. It's already there. Uh, it's only week two, so you probably, maybe, well, maybe you don't have it memorized yet. If you do, I don't know, like cover your eyes or look somewhere else. Try to challenge yourself, see if you can do it without it. But let's read this together. Here we go. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And all God's people said, amen. We'll see you next week.